This is the bit of the presentation you didn't get to hear before. Uh, this is part three, as I've called it here, of the special problem of fires and tunnels. Right, so I was telling you about water-based suppression systems uh, and the bad experience in 1979 in the Nihonzaka Nihon tunnel in Japan. Sprinklers did prevent the fire spread, but the reservoirs ran dry and the fire rapidly spread to all 179 vehicles in the tunnel. Uh, a few experts in the 1960s and 70s made the dubious com claims about the negative aspects. Uh, and I mentioned that careless talks cost lives. So what were these negative aspects? Well, apparently water can cause explosion in petrol. Uh, there's a risk of flammable vapours being produced. Steam can hurt people. Vehicle fires are protected from sprinklers. Smoke stratification is destroyed. It costs a lot to ma maintain. Manual control is tricky and visibility is reduced. So... The conclusion and the wording that went into the standards uh, was that based on these facts, sprinklers cannot be considered as an equipment to save lives. But uh, the experience of uh, sprinklers in tunnels in Australia is very good. There is recently an increased focus on safety. Fire is now perceived to be a major risk for tunnels, not a minor risk as it had previously been. Uh, there is a recent growth in fire safety engineering practice and organisations who make the standards have now changed their stance such that PIARC, which is the uh, World Road Association uh, PIARC stands for the Permanent International Association of Road Congresses which is a bit clumsy uh, but simply known as the World Road Association uh, published last year a document called Road Tunnels and Assessment of Fixed Firefighting Systems uh, FFFS, we'll say, fixed fire fighting systems. In most cases, FFFS are not capable of extinguishing vehicle fires. The aims are to slow down the fire development, reduce or completely prevent the fire from spreading to other vehicles, provide for safe evacuation, maintain tenability for firefighting operations, protect the tunnel structure and limit environmental pollution. To fulfil these purposes, the FFFS must be supported by effective and rapid fire detection and location systems that are optimised to ensure proper functioning of the FFFS, resulting in a highly reliable integrated system. OK, I agree. Point 2. They must be designed to handle air velocities in the range of 10 metres a second that can result from ventilation system operation and na or natural effects. 10 metres a second. That's an awful lot of airflow. That's much faster than most tunnels uh, tend to design for, although it does happen occasionally, but it's an extreme ventilation velocity. So what the PIARC are saying uh, is that um, there must be a... the system must be designed to be able to operate even if the ventilation is as high as 10 metres a second. They also must be demonstrated to mitigate fire development uh, and have an acceptable influence in visibility, especially during their self-rescue phase and be able to reduce radiant heat. Now, sprinklers and water mist systems particularly destroy visibility. Uh, and so I don't know how they can say that. And also, the, But it's the 10 metres a second thing that I'm mostly concerned about here. Uh, so we did some work last year. Uh, so if the requirement is for ventilation to be 10 metres a second, where does the water go? Uh, the situation here, sprinklers are normally operated in zones. You wouldn't put the sprinklers on the whole tunnel, you would just put them on for part of the tunnel. Uh, so zone 1, zone 2, zone 3, we activate two zones, but if there's ventilation, the, uh, obviously it pushes the water slightly to one side. Suppose the situation was a much higher ventilation scenario, uh, you could entirely be missing the fire entirely if you were blowing too much. 10 metres a second may be sufficient to blow uh, all the water away from the fire, which is bad. So where does the water end up? So consider a 50 metre zone with 10 metres a second flow. Uh, here we have five different sizes of droplets. This is Guillermo's model. Uh, so the smallest, the red line you can see there, uh, is the smallest water mist droplet particles at about 35 micrometres uh, in diameter. They are blown away completely. Straight out of the 50 metre zone, gone. Uh, the next size up, which I can't read on this screen, I think it was 90 micron, uh, which is the blue line. Again, they're blown with 10 metres a second airflow, they're blown straight out of the zone. 120 micron green line, straight out of the zone. 170 micron, guess what? Those are big for water mist droplets, but they are completely blown away. It's only things of the order of 300 micron, which is 
sprinkler drops rather than water mist drops that even land in the same 50 metre zone uh, if there's a 10 metre a second flow. If you reduce that flow to 3 metres a second uh, you end up with a situation where still all the smaller droplets are blown straight out of the zone uh, but at least very large water mist droplets and uh, I would say conventional sprinkler droplets do land in about the same position uh, as the where the sprinkler nozzle was and hopefully where the fire is. So, are sprinklers and water mist systems a solution? Well, this still has to be determined. Research is ongoing. The pros of water mists or sprinklers are that they do contain the fire. No one really agrees with that. When the system is, is disagrees with that rather, uh, when the system is in operation, uh, the fire is contained. They do reduce the temperature of the environment. That's true. Uh, and they do hinder fire spread. We can't say that they prevent fire spread, but it does at least hinder it. The cons are, you can't extinguish the fire. If the fire is inside a vehicle, uh, sprinklers have little or no effect at extinguishing it. Uh, it does destroy visibility uh, and therefore hinders egress and may also be incompatible with higher ventilation velocities. So how does that fit figure with smoke control? Of course the best life fire life safety device for a tunnel is another tunnel. The situation there in the picture we have two tunnels uh, beside each other, presumably one for tra travel in one direction, one for travel in the other. Uh, if you have cross passages between them, if an incident happens in one tunnel, people can escape uh, reasonably quickly, hopefully, to the other tunnel. Or even better, like they have in the channel tunnel, a service tunnel. There you've got two main tunnels for the transport and a smaller tunnel in the middle that generally in normal operation is empty uh, but can be accessed uh, in the channel tunnel by vehicles uh, or at least by people. But if you've got an existing tunnel it's extremely expensive to retrofit and may simply not be possible for many tunnels. So, a few questions remain. What on earth is the correct or the best use of ventilation in a fire incident? How and when sprinklers are to be used? Interaction between ventilation and sprinklers, there, that whole area has to be explored. How to control the, vehicle, the vehicles to fuel best? And how to improve escape or self-rescue? Because one thing that's clear from all the fire incidents that have happened in tunnels is that if there are fatalities, they happen early on in the fire before the fire brigade has got there. Uh, so we need to design for self-rescue uh, and not assisted rescue. So that's the end. Thank you, uh, and I hope you learned something there. Thanks.